Hello, and welcome to Talk the Walk. I'm Azam Khan. This year marks the 50th anniversary of Germany-China relations, a defining milestone that is fitting for a potentially defining trip to China by new German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, who is scheduled to fly to Beijing next week with a business delegation. The announcement of his trip came hard on heels of criticism and grumblings by some EU officials and members of his opposition party, who vocally like to take a more stringent stance against China. Brought on by the Ukraine war, Europe is amidst an energy crisis and a realization of an over-dependency on Russian gas. This has sparked some paranoia of perhaps an over-economic dependency on China, Europe's largest trading partner. This fear even recently affected a massive acquisition deal of a terminal in a Hamburg port by Chinese shipping giant Costco, which Schultz was facilitating. As the more anti-China camps around the EU didn't like the idea of China coming near critical infrastructure, despite common practice of foreign investment into global ports. Schultz has argued back that saying his trip is part of an economic trade continuity with China, although some of his European partners wish to handle China in a more united voice. Germany is the biggest and most important member of the EU. He would be the first European leader to visit China in over three years. How significant is this trip for both China and Germany to gain clarity and understandings on political and economic issues? Joining us tonight to unpack the story is London-based financial advisor and founder of LM Research, Leonid Miranov. Thank you for joining me, Mr. Miranov. My pleasure, Azam. There's been a lot of noise and friction behind the Hamburg terminal and Costco deal in recent months by some members of Olaf's opposition and EU officials. I believe the latest report is that the deal has been approved, but at a smaller stake than originally planned, so as to appease to the noise. Um, in foreign investments into countries, ports are quite common globally, but critics were afraid of giving up uh, critical infrastructure to the Chinese. Um, what are your thoughts on what transpired? I think um, it is a very interesting case because it is the microcosm of the current um, predicament that you find itself in, right? Uh, the mistrust towards China is obvious, yet um, if you look into the details of both the deal and the history of the relations, you'll see that um, the, the concerns are clearly overblown. Um, so to begin with, the reason why it's such a sensitive issue, it, you know, the Hamburg port is the Germany's gateway to the world, and it's the third busiest port in uh, Europe. So you will, you know, it, it is obvious that, uh, especially to the German side, it appears a very important uh, piece of infrastructure. However, like you say, uh, it is quite common practice in um, the shipping industry for shipping container operators to own multiple ports around the world. Mm. And the company in question, uh, it's a Hong Kong listed entity, um, Costco ports, they, ha uh, they have been operating a number of ports all over the world, um, and for them, adding Hamburg, a terminal at Hamburg, is only going to be um, a substantial, but not a defining change in uh, their ownership um, of uh, global ports. But more importantly, they own 20% uh, of the port of Antwerpen, uh, a larger European port, and only a couple hundred miles away from Hamburg. And uh, they own 90 percent of CSP terminal in Zabruj, uh, which is <laughs> even closer to Hamburg. What's more, the lease on Zabruj has been extended just this year by 15 years. So um, it, there, is no, there is no continuity in the European position. It's only a question of um, taking you know, uh, political shots at what is essentially an economic uh, issue. Right. Um, and you, they also, I believe, own some stake into Rotterdam as well. Which is a major, major port in Europe. Correct, but but the, but those are you can say that those are minority stakes. But mm. the Bruges is ninety percent owned, right? And then right. Um, the question is, what does a container operator do to the port? Does it move the port around? No. Really? Decide what kind of infrastructure gets built within the uh, aquatory? No. So uh, it's a bit like owning a supermarket in in your area, right? I mean, <clears throat> is it weird that the Chinese company owns it? Maybe to some people, but this is, you know, the 21st century, right? Plus, China is the biggest trading partner, and a lot of these containers originate in China. So, again, it makes sense on a practical level. Right. Many people in the shipping industry said there needs to be a, uh, who are commenting on this, said that people need to understand the, the distinction between owning a terminal, per se, and a port. And it's not exactly, um, it's like you, the analogy you said, if you own a steak in a shop at a supermarket, doesn't mean you have decision making in the supermarket. Precisely, because, um, Again, there is very little uh, that a terminal operator can actually decide upon except uh, practices and efficiency of running it. And uh, Costco has proven to be a very efficient operator. Um, and I think for Germany, there is only upside from this. 
Right. Um, this trip by, uh, with uh, Olaf Scholz is a significant one with a lot of major topics on the line, politically, economically. Um, what are your thoughts on the significance of it and what are your expectations? I actually think that um, the most important part of the trip is the trip itself, if that makes sense, right? It doesn't really matter how many documents get signed or how many deals get done uh, as part of it. But I feel like the fact that it's a solo trip by uh, a German chancellor right after the uh, re-election of Xi Jinping, um, that in itself is the most important sign that there is a pathway to peaceful cooperation, right? I mean, uh, in this environment, it is very important to start showing um, that despite the rhetoric, despite the escalations within the EU, there is nevertheless a pragmatist core that is willing to engage with China on reasonable terms uh, that can be mutually beneficial. Also, the timing of the trip is quite important, because like I said, it's right after the election. But um, this is also a, a an overseas leaders trip into China uh, during COVID. So this is as a sign of China opening up. Um, that is a very interesting one. Um, also, this is just before the November 8th uh, US uh, elections. Again, a very interesting sign uh, to the partners across the Atlantic for, for, for the Germany. So I think Given the backdrop of 2021 being the highest uh, year for bilateral trade between China and the EU, right? Um, uh, you exported over 220 billion uh, euros worth of goods to China and imported almost 500 billion uh, euros worth of goods from China. Uh, highest on record in 21. Obviously, this is going to take a step back in uh, 2022 for obvious reasons. Um, but where do we go from here? Right, there is a big um, contingent uh, within the EU, countries that do not trade with China quite as much as Germany, uh, that are willing to disengage from China on the grounds of um, politics, really. And it, is not, um, it has not been clear how Germany is, is going to go about formulating a consensus around their pragmatic uh, self-interest. And I think this trip, the fact that it is happening, is demonstrating to us that uh, there is clearly a force within Germany that is willing uh, to go ahead with it. Now, of course, practically speaking, there are issues of the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment that's been kicking around since 2013. I don't expect it to be resolved now. Uh, but, you know, uh, Herr Scholz is a well-known proponent of the deal, so maybe he will uh, update us on what he thinks the status of it is, uh, if it's likely to get um, approved anytime soon, on the European side at least. Um, and then, of course, um, there is the obvious uh, geopolitical tensions that uh, will be discussed uh, bilaterally. And But again, the question whether uh, the comments they'll be making will be important. Right. I, I, I don't think a, any meaningful change will be achieved at that meeting, but that meeting itself will be. Uh, the, the fact that it is happening is important enough on its own. Yeah, you said it's a symbolic, uh, you mentioned the symbolic impact of him going there. Um, and I believe it caused, like, French President Macron also wanted to initially join the trip as well with him, but um, he declined um, Macron's uh, suggestion of that. And I think that, that there was the media has been saying mm -hmm. that's been causing some strife between the two. And a couple hours ago, uh, Schultz went over to Paris to meet Macron to sort of smoothen it all out. Um, what do you make of that of that development there? Well, I, th I think it flows very nicely from uh, what we're talking about just earlier because yeah the european uh, predicament is that it it cannot formulate a united front on china because china for all its um, you know size and importance also represents a few different things to europe right it, like i say the biggest trading partner but also uh, ideologically it's clear that some of the european nations especially the smaller ones um, really want to side with the us um, on, on, on a lot of um, issues which makes it very difficult to formulate uh, a united front. And Macron in particular has been uh, leaning towards a harder line on China, right? So, for example, he was uh, instrumental in making sure that the Chinese company doesn't own the Atlantic shipyards uh, in, in France, in Nantes. Um, they were uh, on the way to be sort of uh, to being sold, uh, but uh, he intervened and nationalized it. Um, he's also um, well known for his quotes on China and being hard on China, and it's just not the right time. In fact, to use Macron's uh, own words, he said that 
uh, it is worth to throw a brick to attract jade, uh, Chinese proverb. Uh, last time he was there, now is not the time. Now is the time to try and find compromise, right? Um, and that compromise can only be found by a pragmatist, and uh, Olaf Scholz is the last one, right? If he, <clears throat> There is no one but him who can get it done. Therefore, a solo trip is much more productive. However, the flip side of that is explaining that position to the European partners, because um, Olaf has to sell it to both the Chinese side, which he's done successfully by, you know, making sure that the trip is happening, but also to the European side, hence the trip to uh, Macron, to try and explain to him why uh, his approach will be the uh, better long-term way of dealing with China. Right. So where, why are all these um, voices, these fractures now within? There's a lot of different things that Europe needs to uh, agree upon, whether it's energy policies, um, it's whether it's their stance on China, so there's a lot, like you mentioned, there's a lot of different voices that um, that are coming up with this in Eastern European bloc or Macron's uh, particular approach towards China. So why is this all happening now, per se? Well, I think the obvious ca catalyst is the Russia-China relationship in the context of the Ukraine uh, war. Right. And. Um, mm, but these things have been bubbling away for a very long time, right? The energy policy didn't get broken by Putin, right? The energy policy has been a mess since the mid-2000s. And uh, it, it, the, the unwillingness of the German government to reverse its stance on nuclear, for example, um, is a very good, good example of that, because they are committed to a policy that is clearly not working, but it is entrenched. And it's... Um, more or less the same across the board. Um, all of these tensions have been bubbling up for a very long time because for some uh, EU members, uh, productivity is most important. So Germany is one where they actually make a lot of stuff, much like China. Uh, but if you look at places like Estonia or Latvia, they do not. Um, they do have um, a thriving agrarian sector and a thriving service sector, but they are not uh, in the business of making Mercedeses or you know exporting a lot of uh, finished technological goods. Um, that puts them, their economies on very different pathways and they have very different needs in terms of uh, the strength of the currency, in terms of access to energy and in terms of uh, guarantee markets for said end product. So, for example, uh, Estonia has been uh, exporting a lot of fuel oil to Saudi Arabia this year. Well, how did this happen? Estonia has no oil. Well, they are importing a bunch of crude oil from Russia by rail, putting it on uh, ships and shipping them off to Saudi Arabia. Uh, this has been widely reported uh, by uh, sort of various uh, industry sources, and uh, Bloomberg has done a great summary on this. Um, uh, Mr. Murnau, Germany sorry, cannot... I'll, have to, I'll have to pause you there just for a moment as we take a quick break. Uh, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with financial sure. advisor Leonid Mirnov. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Talk the Walk with me. I'm Azam Khan. For those of you who are just joining in, I'm speaking with Leonid Miranov, London-based financial advisor. Uh, Mr. Miranov, I wanted to talk about the Chinese side of the whole trip because I think uh, most of mainstream media has been focusing on the European side to it. So what can uh, China hope to gain um, in terms of clarity, um, perhaps on where, Ch where Europe stands uh, as a singular voice or not towards China, or perhaps for the upcoming G20 summit? What are your expectations from the Chinese side for Chancellor, Olaf, uh, Chancellor uh, Schultz's trip to China next week? I think um, the most important uh, expectation, I think, for the Chinese side is to make sure that they see a pathway to a continuous thriving relationship with Europe, at least on the trade side. It is, um, it's been a challenging year for Chinese diplomacy, right? And uh, in, in the environment of um, geopolitical change, such as we're experiencing now, it is very important to understand if there is a future uh, to any of these relationships. And uh, it's been a very productive relationship to date. And the question is, can it be going forward? I think uh, the Chinese side has been very open about saying that there is going to be further opening up. There's going to be better access to EU firms to the Chinese market. But this has to come with reciprocity. Uh, European side has to accommodate Chinese interests. And um, it is interesting, again, coming back to the port uh, point, that despite all the hoopla, they were, they were able to find a compromise that worked uh, for both sides. It is that sort of approach to policy that um, Chinese side would be looking for from 
Germany, or at least a guarantee that this approach will be on the table and there will, there's going to be a possibility of compromise. And uh, there are very important <clears throat> points that bring Germany and China together and align their interests. Not least of all is to harden back uh, manufacturing, right? Germany and China are the world's largest manufacturers and they have needs. They need, they need energy, they need clean energy, they need labor and they need markets. And they are very much benefiting from being in the same supply chains. Um, making sure that this relationship continues is paramount for both sides. So um, the, what is important for China is to understand that this relationship can continue. And again, like I said, the fact that this trip is happening is in itself a first step down this path. Now, we can hope that during the talks that they can reach an understanding of at least principles under which this can continue. Right. You mentioned the renewable energy aspect. Could you say that um, this trip could possibly or Europe's energy crisis uh, currently could possibly push them towards China further with because China is a leading renewable energy country um, and especially with this manufacturing side of it as well? I think this is inevitable um, in, in the sense that the renewables are not going to solve EU's energy problems. The EU's energy problems are deep rooted in misallocation, in uh, poor treatment of baseload uh, energies, nuclear and gas generation. And renewables are not going to fix that uh, overnight, but they will help. And for sure, it benefits everybody um, if EU and other countries across the world bring on more renewable capacity in the places where it makes sense and where it works. And China obviously is the leader uh, in this. I think Chinese example is one for Europe to follow because China not only has led the world in uh, renewable generation, it has also led the world in updating the grid for making better use of said uh, renewable generation. Because <clears throat> many European countries have built out renewable capacity, but they've lagged behind in terms of storage, in terms of applying that capacity onto the grid, right? Whereas China, of course, um, has the most storage as well as uh, generation. And for sure, uh, Chinese companies should get access to the European market because there aren't that many options, right? Especially on the solar side. But um, I think that uh, for China, the most important thing is to demonstrate that what they're doing is a reasonable pathway for others to follow and then share its experience, knowledge and uh, technology, in particular with smart grids and um, ultra high net, uh, oh, sorry, ultra high voltage grids, right? They are the only country in the world to build out uh, such a grid. And this is something that uh, Europe very much uh, needs to do. And I would expect Chinese companies to be big players uh, when, as and when Europe makes a decision to do that. Um, I understand you're also uh, an expert in the Belt and Road. And in many ways, this China-German relationship is possibly one of the most defining relationships uh, for the 21st century. Um, and they both literally connect the Belt and Road. And Germany That's is right. not necessarily part of the, the Five Eyes settlement. Um, and obviously, they're very large trading partners for one another. Um, plus his continuity from Olaf uh, following Angela Merkel, who was who Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping had labeled as an old friend. Um, so would you agree with with all of this significance as well behind this trip next week? I think uh, yes, for sure. And part of the reason for Belt and Road uh, initiative taking maybe a bit of a step back in recent years has been um, a, uh, a lack of end product in places like Germany, right? Because uh, like you say, there is a distinct link between China and Germany, like we mentioned before, in terms of manufacturing, in terms of trade. Um, and Belt and Road, especially the um, belt part of it, the uh, land part, um, has been built very well, uh, envisioned very much with a view of accessing the European and mostly German market uh, for Chinese uh, manufacturing. But there's been uh, little to no uptake of, of this idea on the German side. I mean, they're happy to take the shipments, but um, that's about it. For Belt and Road to truly be successful in Europe, uh, there, there's got to be buy-in, right? There's been uh, buy-in in uh, Italy, for example, but not so much in uh, Germany just yet. They absolutely need to bring local German business interests on board, uh, both in terms of facilitating um, German participation, but also in terms of uh, being open minded and active about um, advocating for um, these projects. And I feel like, again, this Hamburg port deal is quite important because it's the step that shows, yes, uh, whilst there is a degree of um, change in sentiment within the broader EU, at least in Germany, uh, China can still do get things done. and. It 
still makes sense to link up uh, all the way. Right. You obviously focus a lot on energy markets as well. So how does Germany's policies towards um, the energy crisis right now differ from other parts of uh, the other European members of the EU? Um, and how does that factor in necessarily with, um, with Schultz's trip next week in meeting China? Well, I think Germany is in a unique position where they actually have a solution in place. They're just choosing to close it down, which is nuclear. And uh, they have three existing uh, nuclear plants that were due to go offline this year. They, their lifetime has been extended until mid next year. Um, all of it is quite weird because, of course, um, this is happening on the back of historically sky high uh, electricity prices. Now, again, because of the nature uh, if you think about what does a manufacturing economy need, it needs people and it needs energy, ideally clean energy. And um, China and Germany's needs are therefore quite similar. And if you look at the population pyramids, they're also quite similar. In fact, by 2050, they are, it looks like they'll have a roughly similar sort of shape of the um, age pyramid. Um, this kind of implies that they're in a very similar position in terms of the energy needs. And China is leading the way in integrating all available sources of energy because they're still big importers of oil and gas but at the same time they're leading the world uh, the world in renewables and in grid integration and in nuclear and in exploring new things like geothermal as well as uh, bringing new sources of oil and gas uh, into production on onshore in in, uh, in china uh, this is something that germany would do well to copy or at least understand and see what alternative take on this they can offer. I think that uh, Germany's uh, policy of dependence on Russian gas has been a rational one, right? There, there was this cheap gas flowing from the east and they're on the way. It's not that far. It's easy to build pipelines. In fact, some pipelines have uh, existed since the 1970s. It made sense why they did it. But this is a new world. And in this environment, it is politically unfeasible to continue. So. Mm, looking east can offer a glimpse of what is possible if you have a comprehensive approach to energy policy that does not exclude any one source. This is something that uh, Germany would need to address one way or the other. And again, I feel like with, in dialogue with China, they can perhaps um, arrive to a more beneficial uh, outcome uh, for everyone, really. Right. And um, the G20 summit is also uh, right around the corner. So how can this uh, trip next week sort of set the table, per se, for when China We'll get to get a chance to meet other European leaders as well. I think for China, it's essential to remind everybody that this is first and foremost an economic issue, uh, that the relationship between um, EU and uh, China is um, a trading relationship first and foremost. And everything else is uh, clouding that, right? And of course, the G20 will be in, in itself focused on other leaders and other issues, because, again, the war is uh, sort of more important at this point in time, even to the Europeans. But the core um, of the EU-China relationship must be intact. And I think that's the message that China has to go and present to the world, that you can think uh, what you like about internal policy, about our uh, governance. This is our approach to governance, and we prefer it. However, we are offering to the world a peaceful way to cooperate, a peaceful way to have uh, mutually beneficial trade and we will be opening up further and inviting your companies to come in and participate in our financial sectors and uh, we will welcome further investment domestically um, with this message um, it will be interesting to see what kind of counter proposals can the EU have are they just gonna um, insist on things being done their way or can they offer a uh, reasonable alternative and I think again uh, Herr Scholz in his trip right now is going to offer the first part of it, but then during the G20, um, in a broader sense, they would need to uh, confirm everything that's uh, being said to, uh, this week. Well, next Leon week. Leonid Miranov, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Talk the Walk. I'm Azam Khan. I'll see you next week.